bringing you a worldview and a community voice while keeping our ever-watchful beady eye on politics and politicians. Good evening. I'm your host, Network Brow Furrow. Welcome to Colorado Inside Out, our weekly look at the issues of this state and beyond and how they affect you, the citizen. Let's introduce our panel. We're pleased to have with us today Miss Colorado 1959, Trisha Calhoun. Miss, tell us something about yourself. Well, I am so honored to have taken over the crown from Marilyn Vanderburg, Colorado's first Miss America, a role model for all women out there and just a great, great Colorado citizen. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Also with us today, Charlton Drizzle with Kopelwitz, book review editor for the Rocky Mountain News. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Also with us today, Al Nakula, Rocky Mountain News beat crime reporter, always uncovering the dirt. That's right. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Well, you know, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Rocky Mountain News this year, and with any luck, I'll be around for the 150th. And rounding out our panel, Sheldon Silverman, up-and-coming real estate attorney. Good to see you, sir. Well, thank you very much, and I do other things as well. I'm at the Sims Building, downtown Denver. Anybody want to call me? I'm in the book, and I coach some Little League, and I have three kids of my own. All right. Let's begin our program. Topic one, the world continues to see the spread of red communism as American relations with Cuba continue to sour since the New Year's Day takeover by rebel leader Fidel Castro. The Chinese are cracking down on protests in Tibet, forcing Buddhist leader the Dalai Lama to seek refuge in India. The Soviet Union is making deals with Iraq and Egypt in the Middle East. And in Southeast Asia, American aid to Vietnam is loose, confused, and disorganized according to Tennessee Senator Albert Gore Sr. Can the U.S. and her allies stem the rising tide of international communism? Ms. Calhoun. Well, as you might imagine, at the Miss America pageant, we all talk about this a lot, the girls from all 50 states now, and we all want world peace, but it doesn't look like world peace is going to be very easy now. What's happening in Cuba is shocking. It's just 90 miles from Florida. I was talking to Miss Florida. I mean, they could come over any time in boats, they've got missiles, they, it's a horrifying situation. Southeast Asia, I don't really understand all of it, but I understand that they could, all those towns, countries could fall like dominoes. So I've been to Maury Middle School, you know, where Mamie died, I doubt Eisenhower attended, and those poor kids have to have duck and cover classes because the threat is so real. So we must fight communism. Well, Mr. Drizzlewick Koplowitz, it's certainly a challenging world out there, world peace is obviously the goal, but uh, there are some complex circumstances internationally. Well, world peace is our goal. World domination and slavery and tyranny is, is the goal of, of, of the Reds. Uh, in regard to your particular questions, for Tibet, I think we're doing the right thing here in Colorado, uh, up where the 10th Mountain Division used to train. Uh, our government's been providing training facilities to the Tibetan patriots who want to eventually, uh, who want to continue the guerrilla war uh, to liberate the country from, uh, from Mao. That, that's the right thing to do. Uh, as for Cuba, it, it's rather dismaying to see all the useful idiots, including those of the New York Times, who were so taken in by Fidel Castro's uh, tour of this country a few months ago. Uh, the fact is, while he was in Washington, D.C. and New York, his brother Raul was sending an emissary over to the Soviet Union uh, to get Marxist-Leninist political trainers and, and indoctrinators uh, to help run the army. Uh, they've banned guns, taken the guns away from the hands of the people. I think that tells you uh, pretty clearly where that government's uh, headed, which is straight, straight into to more red tyranny. As for Albert Gore Sr., the, the Tennessee senator, he's, he's probably right. Uh, about the situation in Vietnam being being disorganized. On the other hand, uh, a man like him who's been a consistent uh, segregationist in the Senate, I really, really wouldn't want to uh, trust his judgment in, in terms of how to deal with, with Asiatics. Uh, but there, there's a broader problem and when he talks about it, the disorganization. You know, last year, uh, a st study showed that fewer than half of the Foreign Service officers in our United States State Department could even speak a foreign language. Now, they've done a crash training program, and that, that figure has improved, and now it's only 15 percent can't speak a foreign language. But it, it's a sign of, of the, the real lethargy and, and torpor of, of this whole Eisenhower administration. And we need to fight the Reds. Instead of having the oldest president in history, maybe we should start thinking about having the youngest one in history. John, Senator Kennedy's thinking about running for president. He had a great visit to Colorado recently. We need to get this country moving again with some vigor and energy in our foreign affairs in, instead of this, this 
uh, lethargy uh, that's characterized the Eisenhower uh, term. Mr. Nakula, what do you make of this Fidel Castro character, and who do you think needs to lead this country in the future? Well, clearly, I think uh, Ike lost us Cuba, okay? And I think the way things are going in Southeast Asia, he's going to lose us there, too. They drove the French out. Eisenhower goes in with what? With advisors, nothing else. Uh, I, I, I think definitely the problems in the State Department and with, with our foreign policy are stemming from Eisenhower and his ineffective foreign policy. And I think maybe Richard Nixon, who's going to run, uh, might be the man to replace him rather than some Democrat. Uh, you know, Adlai Stevenson is going to run again, he says. He's going to be the William Jennings Bryan of the, uh, the mid-century. Specifically, uh, sir, I'm just wondering, uh, what would you like to see happen in Southeast Asia? I think we're going to have to send combat troops at some point. Oh. I really do. I think you're right. And I think, I think we need, I think Eisenhower needs to be backing the regulars in Cuba. We need to go back to the island. We need to retake it. We can't have communism 90 miles from Key West. Key West is very important. Sir. Look, I'm not a foreign policy expert, but I've been watching this guy, Nixon, the vice president. Ike doesn't like him, okay? Nobody should like him. He's a red baiter. And if we've learned anything through the 50s, remember Korea? How'd that work out for us? We're not going to get involved in Vietnam, another prolonged stalemate. What the hell? What are you thinking? And as for Cuba, I'll tell you this. I know human nature. First of all, I went to law school. So did Fidel Castro, by the way. This guy's going to be more practical than that. And there's a little thing called organized crime. They got a good thing going in Cuba. Gambling, that's the future. People like gambling. And here out west, we got this place, Las Vegas, that's getting going. That's too far for people on the East Coast. They need Cuba for gambling. No way will this Castro take charge and turn it into anything other than a gambling mecca. Well, I, you know, I'd agree with you that, that, Cass, that Nixon's a, a scurrilous character, but you, you, you calling him a red baiter, wasn't he right about Alger Hiss? Are you one of those, those deluded people who still think Alger Hiss you know what? Uh, wasn't a communist agent? Uh, wasn't a Soviet spy? Uh, a traitor? How many more people got caught up in that? You know, how many tell, innocent tell me, people tell, had to suffer? Tell, tell me uh, one, Hollywood blacklist, no, it was ridiculous. Oh, well, Richard Nixon isn't, doesn't run Hollywood. Tell me one innocent person that Richard Nixon accused. Richard Nixon tries to scare people. You know, when you have an administration based on just scaring people, scare them this way, scare them that way. How about somebody more hopeful? You mentioned John Kennedy. What a beautiful contrast Kennedy is to Nixon. Well, Mr. Silverman, it is a very scary world out there. Ma'am, I don't want to put you down. You're a lady. You ought to know your place, okay? I acknowledge I'm not a foreign policy expert, but there's no way you can be a foreign policy expert. All right. Mr. Nakula, closing thought. Well, Lyndon Johnson says he's not going to go into the Democratic primaries. He's interested in running for president. He might be the guy, the strong Democrat that's needed to deal with this situation in Vietnam. And I just want to say, one, excuse me, I think you're a very pretty girl. Okay? Bye. Moving on to topic two. Colorado is set to play its own part in fighting the war against communism as companies in our state are building the weapons of tomorrow. The Martin Company of Baltimore has opened a plant near Littleton, which is due to produce the Titan I and new Titan II missiles. The Ball Fruit Jar Company has opened an aerospace division north of Boulder, and plutonium triggers for nuclear weapons are being built at Rocky Flats just south of Boulder. Also, the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs graduated its first class of cadet officers in June, and some of them will run the new command center being constructed underneath Cheyenne Mountain. What do you think about Colorado's role in keeping America safe? Mr. Drizzlewood. Good for Colorado. I'm, I'm glad all these things are happening. And in, in fact, they're long overdue. You know, Albert Wolstetter's article in, in Foreign Affairs uh, earlier this year showed this catastrophic, extremely dangerous missile gap that's in place. And right now, of course, you, you can never know for sure because the Soviet Union's a closed society. But very likely, the best intelligence indicates that the Soviets have opened such a missile gap on us that they could do a first strike against us and we wouldn't have the capacity left to, to retaliate. That, that, that's a situation for either the Soviets to dominate the world uh, or, or us to be destroyed one way or another. We've got to close the missile gap immediately and it, it's really 
horrible to, to see President Eisenhower uh, continuing to deny uh, the existence of the missile gap. And it, it's not just in, in the, the missiles uh, where we're losing uh, the race in the, the aerospace contest. The, the Soviets put up Lunik 1 earlier this year, uh, 17 feet long, uh, went, went to the moon. The first time that a man-made object has actually escaped Earth's, Earth's gravitational field. In that same period, we've been trying to, we put up three different uh, attempted satellite launches. Not one of them made it to the moon. Not one of them got even halfway. They've got the success. We've got the crashes. We're losing in aerospace in every possible way. And it, 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 that's why it really is time for a change in this country. And I got to say, even on the the Eisenhower's theory was we're going to cut back on conventional forces and just use the uh, uh, nuclear uh, deterrent, and he hasn't even been doing a very good job on the nuclear deterrent, but we also need a major buildup uh, of conventional forces, including special forces like the Green Berets. Mr. Nakula, is there any potential concern that this country may be slipping into some kind of prolonged race to develop uh, weapons of war machinery? Well, yeah, there is. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you exactly what it is, because Colorado is going to lead the way in this. We're centrally located, we're far from the coast, we're safe. And, uh, but one thing does concern me with all this militarization we're getting with the Rocky Flats, with the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, with the, uh, the nerve gas up there. One thing does concern me, and that's the fire two years ago at, uh, up at the Rocky Flats plant. Uh, we don't know how much radioactivity got released, and uh, I wish there were more study on it, but I'll tell you what. That stuff will kill you, that radioactivity. Oh, you know, so I think we need, we need to be very, very careful with the development of these plants in the Denver area. You know, if that were some kind of serious issue, don't you think the rock itself would have covered it in some detail? How many paragraphs did that, that fire get? Fifth. Four paragraphs, maybe? Oh, more than that. More than that. Well, I think the negative safety implications of uh, atomic energy are, are perhaps uh, underestimated at this point. Mr. Silverman. Well, I mean, this negativity that I'm hearing from you guys over here, you even use the word negative. What's with being down on Ike? Ike's lettuce to peace and prosperity? I like Ike. I don't know why you don't. Why do you think we're getting all this business in Colorado? Because Ike likes Colorado. He comes here to golf. He comes here to recuperate. His wife's from Colorado, as the lovely lady said. So well, what do you got against uh, Dwight Eisenhower been the greatest thing that ever happened in this country? My big worry is what's going to happen after Ike. The guy was tough and strong. He proved himself in World War II. Now we're going to have an untested leader. That's the problem. But Colorado, Eisenhower loves Colorado, and we love him back. Ms. Calhoun. Well, I would like to bring the discussion back to talking about um, the very interesting federal projects we have brought here. And I do know some things, Mr. Silverman and Mr. Nakula. I know about Rocky Flats. My father helped work with the Chamber of Commerce to campaign to bring that factory here. It is a very safe factory. The fact that your paper sensationalized that in information about the fire, that's just what your newspapers do. But I know they have taken every precaution to make sure that Rocky Flats, there will be no contamination of the property. The fires are no danger. It's going to work out just as well as the Rocky Mountain Arsenal has for the state. Yeah, and good luck in Atlantic City, too. You know, she's, she's a, she is very well informed for a woman and, and uh, a real credit to her sex. That's what I was saying. Let's move on to topic three. Our state celebrates the centennial of the Gold Rush days this year. It is hard to believe it's been 100 years since Albert Richardson and Horace Greeley stepped off of a stagecoach in Denver trying to determine what all the Pikes Peak excitement was about. Those pioneers could not imagine the current rush to the Rockies we are witnessing today. The population in the Denver metro area has nearly doubled in size since the end of World War II to 800,000, and we are expected to exceed 1 million by 1970. And with this growth is coming the needed expansion of our infrastructure. The Valley Highway was completed last year after 10 years of construction, and 6th Avenue are being turned into a freeway as well. A judge ruled against residents of Swansea, Elyria, and Globeville in northeast Denver who are trying to fight plans to split their community with the proposed Interstate 70 Highway. What do you think of all the new freeway and highway projects going on in our town? Mr. Nakula. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm very familiar with that issue, and I'll tell you, Mr. Silverman is right that uh, Eisenhower's done a lot of good for Colorado. One of the things he did 
was when the Colorado and the Utah Highway people said, we have to extend I-70 past Denver, you know, because the original plan in 56 said it was going to end right here at Denver. We went ahead and developed the Valley Highway with the mousetrap interchange. And uh, that's meant to hook up with I-70. And the decision to extend it to the mountains is going to be very beneficial, but it's going to be the death knell for those neighborhoods. There's going to be no way that they're going to be successful in keeping that freeway out of Swansea, Elyria, and Globeville. Right now, we hired a, a, the Colorado Department of Highways hired an engineering company, Pavlo, out of New York. And they're looking at the best way to take I-70 through the mountains. And believe it or not, they're thinking of following US-6 over Vail Pass. And around that new, da that new dam they're building down on the Blue River, down near Dillon, that's uh, going to flood the town of Dillon. And they're talking about taking it straight up Straight Creek and building a tunnel right under the Continental Divide. This is going to mean major, major economic benefit for the city of Denver, which is right at the crossroads, and for the state of Colorado. Well, Mr. Silverman, as a real estate expert, what do you make of the municipal, the municipalities trying to fight this project? Stupid. We got to grow. We got to expand. Mr. Nacula, I'd like your card. I'm working with some guys, Jordan Perlmutter, Sam Primack. We're talking about a development out there called North Glen. You ever heard of that? I think it's going to be big. People say it's too far out. We don't think so. We think people will be living. Once you get the Valley Highway extended, people are going to start living up and down that corridor, and it's going to be a beautiful thing. I think we're a first-class city. We've got a first-class airport at Stapleton, and I want the Rocky to be on the side of the developers. The only hesitation I have about the Valley Highway, have you noticed what's next to it and why they call it the Valley Highway? That's South Platte. What if the South Platte floods? It could happen then what's going to happen to the highway. They better take that into account. Well, Ms. Calhoun, do you think a future North Glen is going to be worth the drive, first of all, and then please talk about the 70 project? Well, I think it probably would be worth the drive. Now, downtown, of course, has many wonderful department stores. We have such great shopping in downtown Denver. Uh, but I think as people want to move in to get their own homes, there's certainly a lot of growth out in the suburban areas. And those people will want to shop too. Women will need department stores. They'll need grocery stores. Uh, but I do want to talk about, I have toured around the state a lot because of the Rush to the Rockies, the 100th anniversary. And I've seen a lot of the smaller communities. And those communities in North Denver, the Swansea, Elyria, those are some of our oldest and most colorful neighborhoods. There are many interesting ethnic groups that have studied there, and it will be a shame if they wind up losing their heritage because of the highway coming through. I would like to see the highway coming, going up further north, which you should like, Mr. Silverman, because it would open more areas to development. This, their empty plains up there, this is a very old neighborhood, and they are going to go right through churches, right through schools. They're going to destroy I don't those know neighborhoods. If that's appropriate, we do need sales ladies who to show our model homes out North Glen. Are you available for something like that? Well, not during my reign, but you could talk to the Miss Colorado pageant people about okay. perhaps me okay, coming out for an appearance. Mr. No, a pretty Drizzle girl can sell a home. Yes. Uh, excuse me, sir. Mr. Well, Drizzlewit Koplowitz, uh, your thoughts on the infrastructure right. project? North Glen, that, that's a great name. That must have taken you guys months of, of uh, a brainstorming to figure out a, a creative name like that. Yeah, how about a South Glen? Is there a South Glen? <laughs> oh, well, they can have Maybe a, in the future? <laughs> yeah, they could have a, a Northeast Glen next to it and a <laughs> West Glen and all that kind of stuff. But, but seriously, they should have put that at the, inter, the interstate highway. It would be better to have it go around 64th Street, where the, that's where the Globeville people have been saying it should go. Then it, it wouldn't interfere with the neighborhood. 64th is so far north that nobody except real estate speculators really thinks there's going to be much housing development out there anyway. And even if there were, supposedly, uh, it could be built around the highway in the first place rather than splitting an existing neighborhood. You know, what concerns me is with all these, these activities and growth going on, that, that's a good thing. But it's just going to be another excuse for the government to raise taxes. You think they could have enough tax money with just the, the, the more people coming in, but they'll say, oh, we, we have to have more taxes and more big government. You know, the fact is, although Mr. Silverman's such an Eisenhower fan, we've got the worst economy, the worst recession right now, another Republican recession, the worst one uh, since the Great Depression. And instead of more taxes, which they're already agitating for, what we need is a tax cut. That's Senator Kennedy's policy. Again, we, we need to get this country moving again, and tax cutting is the way to help the economy, not more government spending. All right. Moving on to topic four. According to a study by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Denver has the highest crime rate among seven cities of similar size. 
Our city ranks number one in rape and robberies, number two in burglaries, number three in murders, assaults, larceny, and auto theft. 31 murders this year represents an increase of 32%. Earlier this year, Denver Police Chief Walter F. Johnson was accused of incompetence and malfeasance in office by the police union. And although charges against Johnson were dismissed, we now have a new police chief, James Childers. What do you think of Denver's crime problems? Mr. Silver. Well, look, I grew up on West Colfax. Colfax and Quitman, maybe that's not the safest neighborhood, but there are plenty of safe neighborhoods in Denver. We just moved with our kids to Virginia Village. Talk about safe. Southeast Denver, that's the place to go. And when it comes to the FBI, you mentioned the FBI. Did you see that movie with Jimmy Stewart, the FBI story? Well, you know all about it because right. it involved that John Gilbert Graham case. What a story. I'm proud of your Thank coverage. You. That was, Thank you. I've been a big fan of yours for a while. And the Rocky Mountain News. May you live to be 150 years old. I just don't worry about it. I think Denver doesn't have a big crime problem. I trust the Denver police. They're honest as the day is long. Ms. Calhoun. I truly don't know what to think about this because I believe our police are trustworthy. But when the, F the FBI is too, and when the FBI comes in and says there are problems here, then we probably have some. I hope <clears throat> Denver can clean things up so that women like myself can walk down the streets without worrying about these kinds of horrible crimes. Do you think we need a bigger police department? I think that's look that's barking up the wrong tree. What we need is to improve the ability of citizens to protect themselves. In Washington State, they're talking about a proposal that would say any adult who passes a background check would be entitled to get a permit to carry a concealed handgun for protection. They may pass that in Washington sooner. I think Colorado should look at something like that as well. Sir, I think everyone knows that the Second Amendment does not apply to individuals. Yes, sir. Well, I think when you look at the burglary rate, it's quite astounding how quickly burglaries have gone up in this city. And I'll tell you what, as long as I've been covering the Denver Police Department, I gotta say, they haven't been very effective at cracking them. There's a lot of unsolved burglaries. You read the police reports, they got no clues at all. I mean, the cops are right there. They're right on the scene. They're not getting much evidence. I think I might have to start looking into that. Mr. Silverman. Well, uh, you're just the man to look into, but I'm telling you, what are you implying? That the Denver police are somehow think, involved in burglaries? Nah, nah. What are you saying? No, nah, no. Nah, what I'm saying is they're pretty good at solving, you know, your, your robberies, your assaults. But for some reason, the burglary rate's going pretty sky high. What? You know, uh, especially in the downtown area. A lot of the businesses are getting hit. Any idea on what might be the cause of that? It, it's astounding. I'll tell you what. It's, it, people leaving no clues behind at all. Well, and I also, we also have to talk about the small, small Doan family. I mean, we do still have crime here that should be should be taken care of. I'm not taking of. part in that kind of conversation, miss. I don't know why you would bring something like that up. I think you should know your place. All right. Let's move on to disgrace of the week. We'll start with Ms. Calhoun. Well, I would be, if I had not been raised well, I would be tempted to use Mr. Silverman as my disgrace. But instead, I'm going to talk about with Hollywood putting out such wonderful movies like Ben-Hur, with shows like Sound of Music on Broadway, we have, you know, and Colorado's responsible, Jack Kerouac, who wrote that horrible book, On the Road. We have these beats now coming out. We have this book, Naked Lunch. What has happened to culture? There's good, wholesome culture out there, but these beats are a problem. Mr. Drizzlewick. Well, I'll say a disgrace is the, uh, the New York State Board of Regents, which finally lost uh, a few months ago in the Supreme Court in Kingsley versus Board of Regents. It's an attempt to censor the movie version of Lady Chatterley's Lover. And now, thanks to the Supreme Court and to Grove Press, which is very courageous, we finally had published in the United States this unexpurgated edition of Lady Chatterley's Lover. Boy, I was reading it before the show. It is hot, smoking hot. Yeah, what, what's it say? Oh. Oh, never Wait, never did, 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 never three never minutes left. It's never trash. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, my disgrace, this week you're going to see the inauguration of Denver's second Republican mayor. The Denver Democratic Party is a disgrace. They let the, they let the seat go when Quig Newton left, and uh, they had uh, Will Nicholson in for a term. Now we got yet another Republican. I don't, think, uh, I don't think you'll ever see another Democratic mayor in Denver. Mr. Silverman. I got to talk about New York, too. A few things, and I'm talking sports. Why the Yankees gave up on the Denver Bears as a farm team, that's ridiculous. After all those great players we supplied, 
and I still can't get used to the Dodgers and the Giants leaving New York for California. What's up with that? All right. It's the time in our program where we move on to something nice. Ms. Calhoun. Well, I do want to repeat something nice about Marilyn Vanderburg, Colorado's first Miss America, really an inspiration and a role model for every girl in this state to know that one day she can grow up and maybe miss, be Miss America too. You're here, sir. Pope John the 23rd has called for a, a new Vatican Council. He's, he's a very old guy, even older than Eisenhower, I think, and he's still leading the way to, to reform and, and renewal and, and keeping up with modern times. We need an American president who'll do the same kind of thing. Mr. Nakul. There's a bright young cop on the Denver Police Force I got to know quite well. Nine-year veteran, Art Dill. His brother Harold's on the force, too. I think you got to keep your eye on this guy. He's an up-and-comer. Yeah. Last word. He's a good West Side boy. Let me tell you about another Denver boy. Robert Hausman, a World War II hero. He's talking about bringing Major League Baseball to Denver, the Continental League. And I hear oh. later this month something called the American Football League and a team called the Denver Broncos. How do you like that at their stadium? How interesting. All right, folks, thank you. And thanks for tuning in to this episode of Colorado Inside Out. We have been proud to bring you this analysis of this week in 1959. Be sure to stay tuned to this television station for important news and analysis. For everyone here at KBDI Public Television, I'm Edward Browferle.